thank you for the great introduction. Um, hi, I am an Egyptian archaeologist. Um, I dig for a living. That's basically what I do. But I just want to ask everyone something. What comes to mind when I say archaeology or Egypt? You probably think of gold, treasure, Indiana Jones, or even Ross from Friends, which actually I get a lot of, even though he's a paleontologist, but we have the same brush, actually, so <laughs> we are the same somehow. But um, what I actually do is I work here. This is the delta in Egypt. So these are all ancient sites um, where people used to live in the ancient world. So I focus here in the delta, why? Uh, because this actually won't exist in the next 40 years. That's why it's really important for us to work here. Um, I track settlement sites in the delta. This is what um, my PhD research is about, because I care about people like me and you. Why did, where did they live? What did they believe in? Who did they worship? So this is what I focus on right now. So how did this all come about? Everyone asks me, why did you even get into archaeology? It's not a really, um, it's not a normal desk job, clearly. I should have maybe gone into engineering, medicine, like many of the people in this room. But um, this is when it all started. I was actually nine years old in school. In third grade, we got shown um, a reenactment video of Howard Carter, the godfather of Egyptology. He was discovering King Tut's tomb. So this is the first time I saw anything that had to do with archaeology. And he was just, um, they just discovered the tomb. He was entering the chamber for the first time ever, going through a little hole, peeping through it with a little candle. And one of the workmen asked him, what do you see? And it's the first time he ever saw anything in the chamber, and all he said was, wonderful things. From that moment, done. I was sold. At nine years old, I can honestly tell you, I knew exactly what I wanted to do in my life. But I had no idea how to do it. But it stuck with me, and I ended up doing it. I became an archaeologist. Fast forward to now, this is what I actually do. This is what I look like in the field. Not quite like Laura Croft. The outfit is kind of different. I can't really pull it off in the regions I work in. But I do think of myself like her in my head. But anyways, this is where I work. Um, I've been lucky enough to work in some extraordinary sites. Um, from El Kuru and Tombos in Sudan, where I focused on uh, New Kingdom tombs and even pyramids, to um, sites in the Delta, like um, royal, the royal city of Sias, as well as temple complexes in Tel Tamai. So really being able to be the first person to hold a piece of history in your hand, and you're the first one to hold something that's been buried for 3,000 plus years, is truly an indescribable feeling. And over the years, I started to have a specialty, and this is one of them. It's um, called geophysical surveying. So it's basically a giant x-ray on the ground. Here I'm um, recalibrating the magnetometer, the machine that um, we use to x-ray the ground, and I'm able to see what kind of structures we're about to excavate, because we don't dig blindly, because that would take us forever. So um, I'm able to see if it's a domestic structure, or if it's a pyramid base, or a temple complex, so we get the idea. And just so you guys know, there are three men holding this ladder, and it's not because I was too heavy on the ladder. It was actually because the ladder was held by one nail. So it is a dangerous job as well. But, um, okay, so it looks like, yeah, I knew what I wanted to do at nine years old, and I made it happen, right? It's that easy. Not quite. The road to this point was actually not as easy as I expected. Um, I, did, I thought I did everything right, okay? Let's fast rewind to when I was nine years old. I knew what I wanted to do, right? But I didn't know how. So I just continued on to my studies. I did my bachelor's in archaeology. That's what you're supposed to do. Then I did my master's, because I really was excelling in it. I did my master's in archaeology and continued to do it in Durham University. Then, what do I do now? I decided it's time to come back to my country. I'm going to come back to Egypt, and um, I'm, gonna, I'm studying Egyptian archaeology. What better place to work on it than in Egypt? I was a little wrong with that one. <laughs> there were some obstacles I didn't anticipate, anticipate at all. So after um, I moved back, super excited, and to be honest with you guys, when I moved back from my master's, I actually thought I was going to become the Minister of Antiquities right then and there. That wasn't so um, accurate. I was a little naive at that age. Um, so I moved back cloud nine, wanting to do everything in the world. You know, I wanted to change everything. 
And then I got hit with a lot of bureaucracy. I wasn't, um, I was kind of in a bubble before that. I didn't know there was so much bureaucracy and resistance in Egypt in particular, but in most countries actually, and especially in this field. So um, I got a lot of backlash for what I was doing. I was continuing my PhD. I got told a lot of excuses that, I mean, I wasn't expecting that I was a girl and I shouldn't be doing this, or maybe I should be studying my PhD abroad. It would be much better or um, that I was um, too young and underqualified, or that I should just get married and have kids. What's the point of an education anyways? So you get told a lot of things. Um, so through all of this, I decided to apply to a bunch of things just to keep me going while I'm doing my PhD. So I applied for six different things, grants, internships, fellowships, you name it. And for the academics in the room, you know how long it takes to do these applications. It's a grueling process. It takes forever. You have to justify yourself in tons of essays, justify your project, get letters of recommendation, whatever. It takes weeks, maybe months to even do this. So anyways, in total, I did six. I had six complete applications. And now it was the waiting period. I'm waiting for them for the results. A Couple weeks went by, I hear from the first one. I get an email on my phone, first line. We regret to inform you, blah, blah, blah. After that, it's just a blur. I don't remember anymore. I got rejected from my first one. It was an internship, that first one. I said, it's fine. Honestly, it hurt a little bit, but I was like, it's fine. I have five more left. I have nothing to lose. Next one came in. Another rejection. The next one and the next one. So at this point, I have five. Five rejections. All of them start off with, we regret to inform you on, in each email. So now I just got used to it. No big deal, right? Five rejections, it was a huge blow to my ego. I was completely devastated. I came back so excited to change everything, and then I, just, I thought I didn't get anything. How can that happen? What did I do wrong? Then, a few months later, actually it took nine months from the day I applied for the sixth application to come in. And that one was um, my REACH application. Whenever I apply for anything, you always, I think you should always have a REACH one. Something that's so out of your league, just apply for it no matter what, just for fun. So the last one, I actually did not, genuinely did not think I was gonna get it. So I remember this day so well. It was 11.15 at night, I was in my dad's office at home. I get an email on my phone and it's that one. I'm like, oh, here we go again. It's another rejection, let me take it. And then in the, um, in the first line, it didn't say, we regret to inform you. It said, dear Ms. Shawi, um, we just want to advise you that the National Geographic Society has awarded you this grant for, this, for the proposed project. And that's how I got it. I actually got my dream, dream position. And it was the sixth application that honestly, I never even thought I was ever going to touch or they were even gonna consider me. And it made sense all of a sudden. I realized why I got rejected from the first five and I shouldn't have been so devastated because this is what was meant for me in the long run. So National Geographic, what does that mean? I got a grant to finally direct my own dig. All this time I've been a part of other teams and other missions and that's how you move up. But to be able to get funding, this is the hardest part for archeologists. You really have to prove why this site is important and why you're qualified enough to head it. So for this one, Nat Geo was backing me up. This is the biggest thing that could ever happen to me and as an archeologist. So over the years, I've been able to go to boot camps in Sweden and DC and meet the most amazing scientists and explorers and adventurers in the world. And to have National Geographic as um, a platform to be on is the most incredible thing. Um, they're extremely supportive with all the work I do. And it really gave me an ego boost. I mean, it's not Geo, who else like, doesn't think that's crazy. So you think, Khalas, I made it, right? From nine years old, I did what I wanted, now I got it, and National Geographic, done. No. Now I have to get um, permission, because you have a permit that you need to get uh, before you run excavation here. So I needed to apply for a bunch of permits, and I thought, it's a done deal, the funding is from National Geographic, that's pretty legit. It wasn't, I got a lot of backlash for that. Um, as you all, guys all know here, we have a lot of issues with getting permissions in any field and we have a lot of resistance. So basically I got told a lot of things that I was too young to do this, to direct my own dig, sometimes too old. Um, 
I got told that um, I wasn't qualified enough. And my favorite was actually from someone in a high position that told me, he asked me, he's like, how do I know National Geographic is uh, legitimate enough? So that one, I really didn't know how to answer, to be honest, <laughs> but maybe he'll figure it out now. <laughs> but, so basically, this is um, the dig site that I received the grant to work on. This is my baby. Um, on the left is a satellite image um, from a spy satellite from the 70s. This is how the site used to look. Those two um, light patches are the two tails. They're elevated mounds. And on the right is how it is today. The southern tail is completely covered. So this is in the delta, what I mentioned earlier. It's completely encroached by modern villages. This is why there's an urgency to work. So the northern tail is where I want to work. So anyways, long story short, after literally a year of battling with everyone, every institution to get this permit, I got it. 12 months later, finally got it, and I'm able to direct my own excavation. So it just wastes a lot of time, honestly, but you're able to do it in the end. And next month, I will be actually going to this site and digging there. So what, basically what I want to tell, especially to the younger generation, is be persistent. If there's something you really, really want to do, go full force, no matter what. And when people tell you no, use that. It, it, it'll actually push you. Rejection will mold you and push you and make you grow for these things. And become resilient. When people keep, when you keep getting things against you, it makes you tougher. You get thick skin over time. At the beginning, yeah, it hurts. But the next rejection stings a little less. And the next one, a little less. You get used to it, and it actually helps you. It's a good thing. And stay focused. Focus on your goals only. And I stress on yours only. Ignore social pressures. You really don't have to pay attention to them. When people tell you no or that you can't do it, be the first to do it. And when people say it's never been done, this is my most hated sentence in the world, really make it happen. You can be the first one to do it. It's really not an issue. And trust the process. No matter what, it all falls into place. I mean, most of the time from experience, when your life seems like it's falling into pieces, it's actually falling into place. And I just wanted to say that um, after all of this, I, I went through a lot of obstacles and there are many more to come, I'm sure. But um, you get through them. And at the end of the day, I'm standing here on this stage as an archeologist, um, and as a National Geographic explorer, and against all odds, really regardless of everyone um, that told me I couldn't do it, I guarantee you that the comeback is always stronger than the setback. Thank you. <laughs>